Welcome to Cross Community Church. Today we are finishing up our series called The Elephant in the Room, where we are talking about the difficult issues that our church or churches, believers, are facing in our society today. And so what we have wanted to do here, it's a continuation of our series through 1 Peter, where throughout the book, Peter was calling the believers there, and then by default us, exiles, which, which means as Christians... Uh, Our home is not here on this earth. Our home is in heaven. But God has seen fit to place us in this place at this time among our group of friends and our family to live as his disciples, to be light in the midst of darkness. So what we wanted to do in this series is just to help translate a bit. How do we as believers live faithfully in the midst of a, a difficult culture that doesn't always understand or appreciate uh, God's ways, God's values, biblical truth being lived out in our life. And so week one, we looked at mental illness. Uh, then we looked at politics. I know y'all been looking forward to that one for quite some time. Uh, week three, we looked at gender identity. And this week, we're going to be looking at, at the idea or the topic of legalization What do we do as Christians when we live in a culture where maybe you remember as a kid where you did something, you went to jail for it, uh, but today it's perfectly legal. You're you're free to do it as much as you want. What do we do uh, with the fact that we live in a society where the values are changing and they're shifting and even cultural perspectives on things are not the same? And so we see it with, uh, certainly in our state, the legalization of marijuana, to smoke or not to smoke, just kidding, I would recommend not smoking, but uh, it's true with gambling. Uh, we see that some states, uh, abortion is legal and others, it's illegal. There are 10 states in the U.S. who have legalized um, doctor-assisted suicide, um, ending of your own life. What about gay marriage? What about polygamy? What about whatever is next? How do we think about this as a church, as people who have been saved by Jesus and want to be faithful to him in this life, in the midst of our culture? um, How do we know what's allowed and what's not allowed? How do we make decisions about the things we'll participate in versus the things that we won't? Today, I want to answer the question for you. How do we honor God and navigate the difficult issues in a culture that is changing. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 1. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Now, they had their own culture. They had their own issues. Things were going on at Ephesus. You should never read the Bible and think, man, they don't get what we're going through. Ephesus was a difficult Place. We're going to see in a minute that the Apostle Paul is going to list some of the sins that the Ephesian believers uh, might have been tempted to get caught up in. Now, he's going to give them strict prohibitions, uh, but listen, there were other things. There were other questions that these believers at Ephesus had to answer about how they were going to live their lives. And so the Apostle Paul is going to give them some wisdom. Here's how to think through these things. Here's how to live as believers in the midst of a difficult Culture. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and look with me in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 5. Here's what Paul says. He says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. How do we live out our faith in the midst of a changing and difficult culture? How do we remain faithful? How do we know how to make decisions? Number one, We walk in love. The Apostle Paul here says, be imitators 
of God. Last week, Joey preached, and he, he brought up the passage in, in Romans chapter 12, which says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here, Paul says, be imitators of God. Like, don't look at culture and just roll along with whatever it says, right? Don't imitate what you see happening around you. Instead, imitate God. And specifically, walk in, live and exemplify the love that God has shown to you. That's the love that you ought to give in return. Be imitators of God. Now, here's the thing. God's love for us initiates our love for God and our love for other people. When you think about the love of God, it is something completely different from how we would normally love one another. As a matter of fact, that song we just sang, it calls, there's a lot of controversy, by the way, about that song, because it calls the love of God reckless. And so people that want to protect God's character would say, God isn't reckless. But to be honest with you, I can't think of a better word to describe the kind of love that we see God showing to us. It's not love that makes sense to us. It's not love that we can wrap our minds around as people. It feels a little bit reckless to us. Now, it's God's perfect divine love. God isn't reckless in his nature or character. He is perfect. And yet this divine love is something so different than what we know. It feels that way. Here's what God did for us. He looked down on us. Us. He looked down on you and he looked down on me. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of our guilt, and in the midst of our shame, God saw you and your whole life. He knew everything wrong you've ever done, every sin you would ever commit, the wicked thoughts that you have thought, the actions that you've engaged in, and not just the ones in your past. He knows about the ones in the future. Like, For God, when Jesus died on the cross, all of your sins were in the future. He knew what was going to come. come. He knew whether or not you would be faithful to him, whether or not you would turn away from him. And yet God sent his son, Jesus Christ. And he took on flesh and he, he lived a perfect, sinless life here on this earth. And then he willingly went to the cross for you and for me. The only thing we bring to the table in our relationship to Jesus, it's not our faithfulness. It's not our goodness. It's not, oh, God, I'm going to do all these things for you. The only thing we bring to the table in our relationship with God is our sin. And yet God, in this overwhelming love, this divine love that doesn't even make sense to us, chose, rather than to give us what we deserve, which was punishment, He chose to send his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and to bleed and to die, that we might find new life in him. Listen, that kind of love is overwhelming. It is that kind of love which transforms us. It transforms our hearts. How do we imitate God, not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind? And it's through engaging with the love of God. And that's a question I want to ask you today. As you sit out here, you're in church. I know that. Have you ever come to understand the love of God for you? That even in the midst of your sin, God delighted in you. He knew your name. He knew your preferences. He knew who you are, all of your thoughts and desires and all of the things that make up who you are. And God loved you as a father delights in his children. He loved you enough to send his son to die in your place. It's that kind of love which transforms us. It is God's initiating love for us that causes us then to love him in return. We love God because he first loved us. Matthew chapter 22, we get the story of a group of Pharisees. These were teachers of the law. A group of Pharisees that came up to Jesus and they were going to ask him some questions. Now, these guys were very, very devout. Like they knew uh, they could quote the first five books of the Old Testament in addition to many other scriptures. Some of them could have quoted all of the prophets as well. Like, They were on it, right? They were very careful to live the law well, to practice that in their lives. And so these Pharisees, um, they would have fasted every single week. 
They would have prayed every day there in the temple. Like they gave alms to the poor. And by the way, when the prophet Malachi said tithe, which is a tenth, give a tenth of all that you're, of, of your increase to the Lord. These guys didn't just tithe off their paycheck, right? There was no discussion or do we tithe on the gross or the net among the Pharisees, right? They went far beyond that. Not only would they tithe of all that they got, they would tithe off of the spices in their kitchen, right? Tearing leaves off of plants to make sure that they were going to give God everything that was his due. And these religious men... They come to Jesus and they ask him a question. Hey, Jesus, what is most important? When we think about the law, like what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers them. And he says, he says this. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. And here's what Jesus just told them. What you have staked your entire life upon, the law, the prophets, obedience to the, all of that, it all hinges on this one command. These commands here, love the Lord your God with all of your being and your neighbor as yourself. And if you get those right, everything else falls into place. But if you get those wrong, nothing else matters. It's interesting because these men who were so devout, Followed the law to a T. They were also very wicked. Matthew chapter 23 is Jesus giving woes to these Pharisees because they've been really careful to, to look good on the outside, but in, inside, their hearts were full of sin and full of wickedness. The crazy thing is that these men, the tragic thing is that these men who had devoted their whole lives to obeying God's law, they did not recognize God in flesh standing right there in their midst. On this day, they were, you know, questioning about the law. They were picking at Jesus. They were trying to catch him in a trap. Rather than bowing down before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, they didn't recognize Jesus when he was right in front of them. For us as believers today, justice was true of them and the believers in the first century. Everything in our lives hinges on that first commandment, loving the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and with all of our mind. With everything that we are, we love God. Can I ask you a question? Do you love God? Have you experienced his overwhelming love for you? Have you understood the gospel, the good news that Jesus saw you in your sin and chose to die for you? That you might have new life in him? Jesus died on the cross for the joy that was set before him because he saw a new and abundant life ahead of you and joyfully went to the cross to purchase that for you. Have you experienced that kind of divine love? Because if we don't get that, nothing else matters. The Apostle Paul, hey, as you seek to live out the Christian life in the culture in which you're living, number one, the first, the greatest, walk in love. Love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You are beloved children. We receive this love from God and then we love God in return and we love others out from that. Giving ourselves up on behalf of other people as Jesus gave himself up for us. So number one, how do we as the church think about living our faith in the midst of a changing culture, laws that are shifting? Number one, we walk in love. No matter what, no matter what culture says or what the laws would teach, we love God with all of our heart. Number two, we walk in the light. When I was a kid, uh, we went and did something you can't do today. Post 9-11 world, you don't get to do stuff like this. But when I was a kid, we got to go tour the Kerr Dam. And listen, there's a lot of cool stuff. I mean, it's like a big dam. You got, you know, barges going through the lock. Neat stuff to see. But I'll tell you what I remember. Uh, I remember when we got to go underneath the dam, there's actually like tunnels under there. 
And that's just kind of awesome, you know. And so we got to see the turbines where the water is pouring through. And they're, they're making electricity. Uh, but the guide, he took us into this tunnel, and it was kind of a group of us, and, and we're making our way through the tunnel, and then all of a sudden, he decided to flip off the lights. And being surrounded by like six feet of concrete, it was completely dark in that room. And where I had walked through that tunnel with zero effort in the light, when I was walking in the dark, man, it was difficult to make my way. I, I did that thing that you do where you kind of stick your rear out and your hands out, you know, and you're, you're trying to make your way and I can't see anything. And I just wanted to be able to kind of feel my way to the wall and making my way through that same tunnel I'd walked through effortlessly in the dark or in the light was incredibly difficult in the dark. Listen, Christians, for us, Paul would say, if you're going to make it living life in the midst of a dark and a sinful culture, You've got to walk in the light. Now, Paul's going to give us some of the struggles that the believers dealt with in Ephesus. He says this in verse 3. He says, but sexual immorality, that was going on. Got that? Check the box here in Poto, right? We get this. But sexual immorality and impurity, check. Covetousness, check. All these things we're dealing with. They must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. So the Apostle Paul, hey, man, you got some things going on in the culture. Some things that you might be tempted with in the church. He gives two warnings to these believers living in these difficult and dark days. Number one, don't be deceived. Did you know that we are constantly being discipled by something? That every time you pick up your phone and you start to scroll or you're, you know, watching something on YouTube or the television or you're reading the signs as you drive down the road listening to music, you are being discipled by something. You need to know that we have an enemy who is committed to our destruction. What he really wants to do is deceive you. He wants to lead you into some of these things that will bring destruction into your life. Like, it's happening right now. And more importantly, parents, it's happening to your children. One of the primary tools that our enemy is using to disciple our children is the screen that they're staring at hours and hours and hours a day, and they're getting messages to do something contrary to what the Word of God teaches. We've got to be careful in what we allow into our lives, into the lives of our kids. We're warned, do not be Deceived. I don't know about you, but there's, there's, y'all ever watch like YouTube shorts, scroll through some things on Facebook? Maybe you're young and hip and you have TikTok, right? And sometimes that stuff's kind of convincing, isn't it? Like, hmm, that's a pretty good point. You're being discipled. Don't be deceived. The second warning he says is don't partner with them. For unbelievers, listen. We were all unbelievers at one point. We know what it is to be led by our flesh, to to grope around in the darkness just trying to make our way through life. We know what that is. We've lived that life. But if you are here, you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, Paul's like, hey, don't partner with that again. Man, don't go back down that dark corridor of your sin. Like, Don't walk back that path where you've already been destroyed before. Instead, Walk in light, loving God, setting him aside in your heart as the foremost. He is your greatest love, which means when God says it, that's what you're going to do. And then walk in the light that he's given. You know what God has given us as believers? And listen, we have a great treasure. God has given us his word and he's given us his spirit to illuminate our path. 
And we have the word of God which reveals Jesus Christ, the way and the truth and the life for us. God has revealed himself to us in his word, and the word teaches us of God's ways and how we should live. And then Jesus died on the cross, rose on the third day, and as he ascended into heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised him from the dead, to live within us. And he is our guide. He is our counselor. He is our comforter. We have an opportunity to live vibrant, faithful Christian lives in this world, even though there's darkness all around. So we walk in love, and we walk in the light. The Word says it. One of the things that we try to teach you to do over and over and over again in this church is just ask this simple question. What does God's Word have to say about that? Like when it comes to my sexuality, what does God's Word have to say about that? What about when I think about these substances that I I would kind of like to partake in? What does God's word have to say about that? Like, what do the scriptures teach? And most of the time, the scriptures will speak directly to the issues. And when they don't, God hasn't left us without witness, right? He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. And then he's given us other people. Look what he says here in verse 15. You walk in love. You walk in the light, and you walk in wisdom. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Man, the day in which we live, it's it's not any different than the first century. The days are evil. Man, there's sin out there at every corner. Like, we have the opportunity to sin all day, every day, right? We know what that is. Like, it's there. And so Paul Hey, be careful where you walk. Be careful the steps that you take in your life. Walk in wisdom and not in foolishness. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. The thing that you and I ought to be controlled by is not our impulses and our desires. It shouldn't be alcohol or any other substance. It ought to be the Holy Spirit leading us on this path to life. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he throws in this phrase, this little sentence at the end, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Seems like kind of an interesting add-on, isn't it? Hey, don't be foolish in the way that you live your life, living as unwise. Live your lives wisely. Man, be careful about your steps. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. If we're going to be faithful rather than foolish, we're going to live these victorious Christian lives where we don't yield to culture, we're not going to do that alone. To try to make it through life on your own is foolish. But to have people around you that you're willing to submit yourself to, that is walking in wisdom. And that's how we make it. That's how we avoid getting deceived and and partnering with with those who are uh, walking in the midst of darkness. We submit ourselves to one another. And we open the door and we invite people, godly men and women, to speak into our lives. You know, there are some things that the Bible just doesn't spell out clearly, right? Not every single issue that we're going to face and, you know, times are changing, there's new stuff coming. The Bible doesn't lay out a specific verse for every issue. That doesn't mean the Bible doesn't speak. And where the Bible may not be as clear as we would hope or we're not sure which way to go, if we will submit ourselves to a group of godly men and wisdom, not making decisions on our own, not plowing straight ahead on our own, but instead submitting ourselves to other people, it's then that we walk in wisdom. It's then that we can have hope that we're going to be faithful to the end. Proverbs 11.14 says, Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in abundance of counselors, there is safety. We all need people in our lives who love us enough to tell us when they see us getting off track. 
Y'all, this week was maybe one of the most difficult weeks of sermon preparation in my life. I'm like, hmm, this topic doesn't seem all that difficult. Like, what's the big deal? Man, the, the reason it was so difficult for me this week, I had a hard time focusing for five minutes. You want to know why? Because there are many men and women in this room, in our church, you would know their names, whose lives are going off the rails. And it's not some clever thing. It's not a new thing the enemy did. It's stuff that we know better than. That if we were to like gather a focus group around and be like, hey, who thinks it's a great idea to have an affair? Everyone would be like, no, don't do it. It's going to ruin your life and your marriage and your family. There they went. Like none of you, nobody in this room would be like, hey, go find an addiction. It's going to be really great for your life. Still they win. Do you know why that happened? Because in each of those cases, rather than submitting themselves to other believers, saying, hey, can I be open about my life? Can I invite you in to speak into my life? Listen, they went to those places alone. When you're alone, you're in danger, period. God did not intend for you and I to go through our life alone. It's a foolish way to live. And listen, in our culture, where there's a deceiver, man, where laws and things are changing, you need other people to walk alongside you. You walk in love, yes. You walk in the light to the best of your ability, looking to the Word and the Spirit. But then you walk in wisdom. And you invite other people to speak into your life. I want to challenge you today. If you're here and you're a part of a community group, ask this question to your group tonight. Ask them, where do you see danger in my life? As you look at my life and you see the way I'm going, you know, the, the way that I'm living, and I hope that you've been honest with your community group. If not, you're being foolish. But I hope you're being open and honest about what's going on in your life. Ask them the question, where do you see that I'm... I'm headed for the cliff. Where do you see that my life is in danger? And listen, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ that you might walk in wisdom and avoid the pitfalls of this life. You have an enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that you might have life and have it to the fullest. Walk in love. Walk in light. And walk in wisdom. So a few practical ways for, for you. As you think about making decisions, about the, the choices you're making, the circumstances of your life, um, ask yourself, ask others, does this thing, this decision, this choice reflect love and reverence for God and others? Does this decision honor God and what he's taught clearly in his word? Does it honor his creation? Does this honor other people? Or is this really about me indulging my flesh? Does this reflect loving others as much as I love myself? Number two, does this thing, decision, or choice reflect submission to God's Word and God's Spirit? Is it in alignment with the clear teaching of the Word? Listen, I know, I've been around long enough to know that you can get on the internet and find a crazy that will tell you that whatever you want to do is a good idea. And they might even use Scripture to do it, right? There's a lot of crazies on the internet. Listen, there's a big difference between crazy and the clear teaching of Scripture. Right? You want to listen to godly wisdom and people in your life and not crazies that might validate you as you run headlong into sin. And then the final thing, do the godly men and women in my life believe that this is good and wise and right? And then you make your decision. We think about what's legal, what things can I participate in, what, you know, what's out there on the horizon for me, what should I do? Walk in love. Walk in light, walk in wisdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and that you've given us your word to guide us. God, we're thankful for the love with which you love us that is divine love. It's hard for us to even understand or express that you would love us in our sin. When we had nothing to give you in return, you poured out your love and your grace and your mercy. You sacrificially gave your life for us. God, I pray that that love, that understanding of the gospel would take root deep within us and it would bear fruit in our lives that we might love you and others in return. God, I pray that we might be people of the word who submit to you, to your word and your spirit, 
And God, I pray that we would be a people who walk in wisdom. And there's someone out there right now that doesn't know you. God, I pray that you would open their eyes to the truth of the gospel. That today might be the day of salvation where they see this overwhelming love that may only be described as reckless for them. God, they surrender their life to you. God, for that person who's right there on the edge. They're about to make that decision. They're about to do that thing. It's going to cause a tremendous amount of pain in their life. Lord, I pray that today, in your word, that you might just shine a light on that situation. That they might not be deceived or jump in with, with sinful behaviors, but instead they might follow you. God, for that person who's here and they're not walking in wisdom, and they're, they're going alone and they're in danger, I pray that they might seek out people in their life, they might jump into a community group, and they might follow you walking in wisdom instead of flirting with danger. God, we just pray this in Jesus' name. We pray that you may move and work at this church, that we might be faithful in this community where you have placed us, live lives as faithful disciples. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm going to invite you to stand and respond in obedience, however Jesus may be leading. And if you need...